Hello, everyone. I'd like to start the proceedings by acknowledging and paying respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, where I stand at the moment, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge any uh, Indigenous First Nation people who are in the room with us or who are watching uh, online. Well, welcome, uh, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to this event as part of the Festival of uh, uh, Urbanism. My name is Adrian Keane, and I'm the Deputy Head of School of Architecture, Design and Planning at Sydney University. And it's, this is where we are at the moment, which is great. Uh, today, we're actually going to discuss and learn about food futures in urban places, solidarity, circularity, and transition. And we have a great lineup of speakers today to discuss this. So, before I introduce the speakers, I just thought I'd let you know that after we hear from these four fabulous people, we'll have the opportunity actually to run a panel. And I have received some questions uh, for some of the, from the online people, but I'll also be coming up with a couple of myself to see what we can to start. And then we'll have. Um, questions from the floor. So we'll do all that after our speakers. But let me introduce them. So our first speaker today is Stephen Healy. And Stephen is an Associate Professor in Geography and Urban Studies. He's a Research Fellow at the Institute of Culture and Society at Western Sydney University uh, and Board Member of the Community Economies Institute. His research focuses on the role of diverse economic institutions in process of social transformation. Welcome, Stephen. Abby Melek Lost is a design studies scholar engaged in interdisciplinary design led social research and the director of postgraduate design studies at UTS. Welcome to you, Abby. Michelle Zybots is a senior lecturer in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UTS and transport planner, specialising in the analysis of sustainable urban passenger transport systems. She's also a farmer. Welcome to you, Michelle. And Gabriel Morelli is a PhD student in urban studies at the University of Milan and Bicocca, and currently a visiting fellow at the Institute for Culture and Society, Western Sydney University. Welcome to you as well. So let's start and invite Stephen up to the lectern. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks very much for that warm welcome. So um, I'm, we're delighted to be a part of the Festival of Urbanism and express our gratitude to the event organizers. So our shared entry point across this panel of different urban contexts and projects is how relationships of trust, cooperation, and solidarity help to secure food futures. Abby, Michelle, and I encountered one another through a project focused on the circular economy, which brings to mind figures like this one, adapted from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, that seeks to supplant linear, take, make, waste economies with ones that emphasize material reuse and repair as well as uh, the turning of waste into a feedstock or resource. The dominant conversation about circularity treats the concept as a largely technical proposition, one practically focused on extending waste management, little more than advanced recycling. In the Australian context, the mantra, waste as opportunity, comes with the danger that opportunity is reduced to opportunity for business as usual. What if we had a more encompassing view of the social? one that expands a shared understanding of who can reclaim the value of waste, uh, detach from processes that are wasteful, or experiment with new forms of custodial responsibility for waste. The relationship between organic waste, agriculture, and food futures is one of the sectors that we're concerned with in this uh, project that's being sponsored by the ARC, where we are attempting to make the social appear in our thinking about circularity. So Cowra is a regional center that's home to large-scale agricultural activity and value-added food manufacturing. Cowra faces a lot of the same pressures um, facing other regional centers, so climate change, continuity of place, but also, and more pointedly at the present moment, access to affordable energy and fertilizer in a context where their costs are uncertain. 
So Cowra is home to a, a group called CLEAN, a network that has for the last decade or so been laying the groundwork for economic innovation where agriculture, industrial, and household organic waste is transformed into power. CLEAN's proposition positions itself as a, in cooperation with local government, operating as a for-benefit corporate entity. As the project has evolved, it's divided into two sites, a northwest node that links effluent from an abattoir to a biodigestion lagoon to a gas-powered 355-kilowatt generator operational this year, built and managed by the um, US firm Martin Engineering. A second and more ambitious node attempts to link the same food waste energy scheme to Cowers Municipal Sewerage Treatment Plant, a nearby food processing plant, and other industries that could make use of the heat and power produced by the biodigester. The difference between these two sites provides an object lesson in how the social figures into circularity, or for that matter, um, um, the future of energy security or regional futures. The abattoir plant was able to move ahead in part because it's a straightforward commercial uh, relationship. Martin Engineering is selling power at a reasonable price point to the abattoir um, and expects to repay its four million invested within four years. Correspondingly, the power output, while modest, allows the energy intensive abattoir to consume power and remain in a lower tiered uh, pricing structure when they're purchasing power from the grid. The more ambitious node proposes to modify existing infrastructure via microgrids to distribute power to adjacent end users, to modify underground infrastructure to pipe residual heat to end users such as a glass house and cannery. But the point at which things have found it is the reluctance of the municipal waste service provider to participate for fear of perceived favoritism. So they don't want to appear to be um, being unduly influenced by this organization. So what's at stake here is how to secure access to energy and fertilizer and in turn um, the impacts of that access on regional futures and food security. What this points to is a need to have a larger conversation about trust, what it means to operate in the interest of the public, and who or what can act as a steward of the commonwealth in ways that extend our capacity to cooperate. So clean sort of an example for us of how a for-benefit uh, organization can work to sort of think more embracingly about who's securing a regional future. Uh, and I think this could be extended easily to other infrastructures. So there's a larger conversation here to be had about um, food continuity uh, at a moment, I think, when the stakes are really quite high. Uh, and in particular, I'm thinking about recent work that's come out of uh, the Center for Urban Transformation about the rate at which uh, agricultural land is being lost. It's actually far greater than what was predicted by the Institute for Sustainable Futures in their report from just a few years earlier. All right, so I look forward to the conversation afterwards, and I'm just going to hand the mic over to the next speaker, Abby. Well, I might take the um, opportunity to pop in here, um, actually. Thank you very much for that, Stephen. You've raised a couple of things. I've written notes about them and how we might actually unpack some of those in the, the panel. But the idea about opportunity, about there was a bit about economics and also the idea about, about trust. So thank you for that. So that leads us, I think, really quite nicely uh, to hear from Abby. You're welcome. Hello. I'm going to be talking about the role of the university um, in, as, a, as a living lab um, in this idea of a more circular or socially circular food future. All right. So the reuse of organic waste has great potential in improving the quality of our depleted soils in which much of our food grows and therefore potentially contributes to our food security. However, Closing the loop on food waste requires a transformation in the way that we think about waste. Waste in the city is the abject refuse of our daily consumption. Mostly it sits in bins until we bury it in the ground, or it's burnt into the air, or flushed into our waterways. Common organic wastes are a particular problem because of their volatile smell. According to council workers, two particular culprits, a result of the uptick in coffee shops and companion animals in cities, a dog poo in bioplastic bags, and dairy and nut milks congealing in the bottom of takeaway food cups. 
Evidently, these are the worst of the worst. One can only imagine what cities once smelt like. The philosopher Ivan Illich, writing about the hygienic imagination, tells us that it took two centuries for Western city dwellers to learn to feel revulsion at the smell of their own bodily waste. And so technologies were created to carry it away promptly, like the flush toilet. We tend to forget how deeply ingrained in our sensory habits are conventions of comfort, cleanliness and convenience, to quote uh, sociologist Elizabeth Shove, all of which are challenged by the prospect of reutilising organic wastes and transitioning our urban places to be more circular. If we are to close the loop on food waste, um, collect it, compost it, transport it, store it, exercise custodial responsibility over it, as Stephen put it, we're going to need to retrain our sensory reactions to organic waste and develop tolerances and practices that aren't currently common. Safe or accommodating spaces for that activity in the urban environment are crucially important. For the last 10 years, I've been working with my wonderful colleagues, Dina Pham and Alexandra Crosby and others on projects that use the university campus as a living lab for closing the loop on organic waste. Unlike the science lab, the living lab explores collaborative learning in an, a living social setting. For example, collaborative learning about the management of food waste as discussed in this article. As a living lab, the university campus is an important space where we can skin our knees as we learn together, experiment and co-produce knowledge with diverse stakeholders. The project Transitioning to Sustainable Sanitation Futures, also known as the Funny Dunny Project, led by the Institute for Sustainable Futures at UTS, explored the potential of using human urine as a partial substitute for mined phosphate rock, a non-renewable resource and a critical ingredient in the fertiliser we need to grow food. This project was based on important research by Dana Cordell and colleagues at the Institute on peak phosphorus, which was at the time, and this was about 2010-11, um, the initial pilot study, um, was quite under the radar. For this pilot in nutrient recovery, urine diverting toilets were installed at UTS. Uh, the urine was collected and then used in trials at Western Sydney's agricultural campus at Hawkesbury. The project brought together a diversity of academic industry and government stakeholders to explore the technical, legal, ecological, economic and of course social ramifications of this experiment in a context, we shouldn't forget, in which Australians balk at drinking recycled water, let alone the prospect of growing food in soils containing human waste. While the project identified big challenges across these dimensions, which meant the system wouldn't be implemented anytime soon, significant social learning came from it, particularly the conversation staged between the major stakeholders and the future possibilities and lines of research this conversation opened up. The next project, which our next speaker, Michelle, may pick up on, I'm not 100% sure, um, was to explore the implications of collecting all food waste on campus at UTS to be dehydrated on site. The dehydrator is pictured um, in the centre bottom uh, and used as a soil conditioner on local parks and gardens. The project at its pre-COVID peak was collecting over 70% uh, of the food waste produced on campus with a projected potential to convert more than 50 tonnes of raw organics into five to six tonnes of soil conditioner per year. As a living lab, the project reveals several important sticking points. A collection system that prevents contamination is very tricky and there are implications in relation to the food we eat, given that the food waste dehydrator cannot process large animal bones or forks. You can see at the top, that's the output. And as with the use of urine, there are significant risks around using the output, not the least legal and health, um, that need to be explored via further research. So there's a whole research funding dimension to this um, we won't have time to explore now. Another challenge was around the smell, which was described, which has been described as a bit like Christmas pudding. That may sound quite nice, but as a constant has been quite off-putting for operations staff and for passers-by. So the ventilation system of the building will need to be reconfigured. 
As a signatory on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the university has a responsibility to ensure that the project goes forward, and so this adaptation is likely to happen. But this situation does point to uh, major challenges of adapting our cities to transition from linear to circular systems. It is rare to move out of good news story territory when we are trying to support change and to document failures and sticking points. Uh, however, embracing these are critical for more resilient change and to nut out some of the more cooperative ways that we will need to work together moving forward. Using the campus as a living lab helps us to learn together what a more sustainable and responsible urban food future looks and smells like. It helps stakeholders to value challenges and even failures as learning opportunities. It's an important piece of the puzzle if we are to start conceiving of cities as places where we don't only consume but also produce, care, and grow care for and grow resources as well as to demonstrate and influence wider change. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Abby. I feel um, guilty now as a dog earner using, using biodynamic uh, plastic bags. Um, there were lots of things in there. Um, the uh, issues around, you know, how um, you know the everyday person is dealing with, you know, smell, for example, and how we could address that. But you know, the issue of community engagement, getting people in, engaged in, in helping to come up with this collaboration or supporting the collaboration. But I, I, I was um, also struck too about if you don't have a safe space to experiment in universities, where, where can you? So we can, we can look at that as well. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Michelle Seibotts and I'd welcome her to the lectern. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, well, usually I, um, I work as a transport planner, uh, but today I've got my other hat on, which is my farmer's hat. And I guess I'm at the, um, the other end of the, the loop that Abby was describing, um, and I've got a lot of skin on my knees, uh, in that I, uh, the farm that I own at, um, at Hartley Vale near Lithgow is uh, the place where a lot of the dehydrated food waste from UTS has been going to. And so what I'm going to do now is take you through a, a roller coaster ride of very beautiful pictures uh, from my farm where we grow um, organically grown garlic. We produce organically grown uh, garlic. And we um, do that primarily with composting. We put compost into our soils and that compost has been made largely from coffee grounds. I'm very, very interested in coffee grounds and what city folks do with them, and, uh, and also the dehydrated food waste. So this is a very um, cursory, I guess, picture of the circular economy uh, loop that we're uh, creating. <clears throat> and here it is geographically. So one of the... One of the points I'd like to raise is um, this element of trust. And I'd like to raise the um, idea of the need for trust in a compact that exists between urban communities like Greater Sydney and peri-urban communities like us out at Hartley Vale or Lithgow, um, which is on the other side of the Blue Mountains, which is where our, our farm is located. So I believe that... Um, for a lot of circular economy processes to work, especially those relating to food production, there needs to be greater relationships that develop between uh, urban communities and peri-urban communities. So we need to know each other, uh, we need to get along, we need to trust each other because we all have important roles to play in creating the, uh, the food futures that I think we're all, all wanting to, to see emerge. Okay. So, what happens to it? So this is what we do. This is um, a, a lovely bucolic picture of my sister shoveling out coffee grounds and food waste from my old ute. Um, when you're 
doing, when you're experimenting in a safe space, and a lot's been mentioned about that, uh, you're doing, a, and what we've done is um, you're, you're creating proof of concept versions of what could, could be generated. So this is a very, if you like, out of the shed type version of what what could be done, you can imagine in later stages, once you've got that proof of concept up, that you know, you've got bigger machinery and you're doing all of this in, in bigger volumes. So here we are with composting. Um, these are our compost mounds. Interestingly, the, the mound at the, um, the front, which is this one here, uh, that's made with uh, coffee grounds and food waste. That one, I think, is just coffee grounds, and that's a commercial... Um, uh, compost mound. These ones have got better pH levels and these both of these mounds are filled with earthworms that are important for uh, creating the, the sort of soil structure that you need on a, on a farm. Whereas this, this um, compost here, very good quality, but it doesn't have the, the earthworms in it. Um, here we are with some of the finished product just before, uh, before being harvested. Um, and here it is drying. Garlic is a, I love garlic, and it's a beautiful looking vegetable, but we get these huge rooms full of garlic, um, as you can see here, when we're putting them through their drying processes. So we dry garlic uh, for about six weeks before it comes to market, and here we are at the marketplace, um, or the local marketplace here, which is the, uh, which is Alfalfa House, which is just up the road here. So. Uh, one of the points I'd like to finish on is uh, what happens next with our process. So we're looking at trying to upscale everything, but what's also interesting is that Lithgow has been earmarked as a place, or was earmarked as a place where Sydney's waste would go to. And the point that I think a lot of local people from Lithgow would make is that we'd be very happy to take a dehydrated food waste given that 45% of waste that goes to landfill in Sydney is uh, food waste, we'd be very happy to take that and use it for some, to create something beautiful like the garlic that you've just seen. But we'd, we wouldn't be so happy about taking all of your landfill and burning it in one of the old decommissioned uh, coal fire generation sites. All right, so back to that point of trust. Uh, I think what's really important is that there are beautiful connections that could be built between urban and peri-urban uh, or rural communities like ours, and there are some great things that we can create, but we need to, um, well, you need to trust that we will, you know, grow your foodstuffs really well, but we need to trust that you're doing the right thing with food waste that we then take and process in some way in order to create these outcomes. So I'll just finish on that point. There you go. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. That's a very important, um, I think, lesson that cities and regions are connected. So we should be thinking about that a bit more, something that we can explore uh, soon as well. So our last speaker um, is uh, Gabriel uh, Morelli, and uh, he's going to let us know what's uh, happening in Bologna, I understand. Welcome. So good afternoon, everyone. So I'm really grateful for uh, being here in this wonderful venue and uh, such a stimulating intellectual environment. So um, I'm going to talk about a context that, as you heard, like is far away from the previous ones. Um, but I think uh, it's mostly in geographical terms, meaning that conversation on securing food futures uh, through solidarity are happening all over the world. So we'll therefore talk a bit about a place, which is called Bologna, a city where I actually live. Um, Bologna is a city in the north of Italy, and it's the capital of the Emilia-Romagna region. Bologna is historically known for its um, cooperative and civic tradition, as well as social movements, and is often at the forefront of social experimentation in the country. In this sense, I think it might represent um, an inspiring place to look at when thinking about food futures. 
uh, in the last few years, there's been actually an increasing attention to food production and consumption, to the point that Bologna is presenting itself uh, increasingly as the city of food. Well, city of food is actually a city branding project promoted by the municipality of Bologna since 2014 to actually increase the city's visibility and competitiveness. So in this sense, I think that different narratives, practices, and expectations are taking place at the same time. Um, so food policies are often ambivalent, and this reflects, I think, the unfolding conversation between institutions and society, where different ideas, uh, power relations, and struggles take place simultaneously. So on the one hand, there are concerns that public policies uh, might move in a direction of supporting further commodification of food, touristification, and so on. So with all the so-called relative negative externalities. Um, on the other hand, uh, there seems to have, that we have much evidence that indicators should follow different paths to ensure like, healthy, sustainable, ethical, and as local as possible food production and consumption. Um, this map that I'm showing you um, is called Bologna is Fair. It was realized in 2018, and uh, the idea was promoting commercial activities in the city center. You can see the historical city center that meet the criteria of sustainable uh, economy. So there's actually an ongoing conversation happening uh, on how to secure our needs in a sustainable manner, including food futures. Now I will briefly discuss uh, two examples of grassroots and self-managed initiatives that are taking place in Bologna that could contribute to the debate, uh, not only about how to effectively secure, again, food futures, but also about our collective thinking on commons and social value. So the first case study that I would like to present is called Arvaya, uh, which actually means Greenpeace in the local dialect, as you can guess from the logo. Uh, it's the first case of community-supported agriculture in Italy. It was founded in 2013. It is an agricultural cooperative inspired by the French AMAP, which means uh, Association for Maintaining Small-Scale Family Farming. Uh, it's a model that promotes a relationship of trust between local farmers and consumers. So Arvaya was created from the initiative of a, a group of citizens that, um, to cultivate land owned by the municipality, to reclaim it as a common good and make it accessible for local citizens to have sustainable local and organic food. It has managed to grow over time and is now about to celebrate its 10th year of operation. Um, just a few uh, data from 2001. Arvaya has 548 members. It cultivates 47 acres of land with uh, 56 varieties of vegetables and eight species of cereals. It has produced almost 80,000 kilograms of vegetables and 60,000 kilograms of cereals. No use of synthetic pesticides since it's a fully organic production. And uh, it avoided a packaging consumption of an estimate of almost 500 kilograms. Um, Arvaya employs eight farmers, but its operations also rely on the voluntary cooperation of its members, who uh, provide all kinds of support, like from harvesting to IT. The CSA is self-managed and self-financed. It is organized into eight working groups and has distribution points um, of its products across the city. Uh, it's also involved in different solidarity economy networks, uh, promotes different cultural and awareness raising initiatives, and cooperates with local organizations, schools, and co-ops to spread the principles of agroecology. And one of the main uh, points of discussion within the co-op, but also with the public administration, which uh, actually affects uh, its economic sustainability, concerns the land uh, agreement, agreement, land lease agreement, sorry. In fact, um, Arvaya pays a rent to the municipality at a market price. Even though it is non-profit oriented, uh, it largely relies on volunteers, and it's also, uh, it does work to protect the public heritage and landscape. So this might signal that the activity is not fully recognized uh, for um, the social environmental value that produces. 
Then the second case study I will briefly present is that of a food co-op called Camilla Community Emporium. It's again the first example in Italy inspired by the New, York, New York's Park Slope Food Co-op and adapted to the Italian context. It was founded in 2018 on the initiative of Solidarity Purchasing Group called Alchemilla and a farmer's network called Cambia Perti. The COP has more than 600 members and is completely self-managed and self-financed. Its members basically have access to uh, fair meal, sustainable local and ethical food and detergent products. The COP has created its own charter of values and principles on which its product selection is actually based. Uh, just a few examples of its environmental impact reduction. Um, in the Emporium, there are no grocery bags, so members are asked to bring their own. Uh, whenever possible, bulk products and short sustainable supply chain are favored. Uh, and also glass jars, for example, they are returned pr to producers by members after use. Members of the food cop are owners, workers, and customers at the same time. And similarly to the other, to Arvaya, uh, Camilla has two employees. But again, it relies also on the voluntary work of its members. It's organized into 11 working groups, and it has actually a, a rich and vibrant community life with an incredible exchange of knowledge, care, and solidarity among members and beyond. Uh, in the startup phase, uh, the COP sought to explore the possibility of receiving support uh, from the local government. Uh, the COP has always wanted to be very independent, and still it is fully independent, but its main request was back then to have access to suitable premises on uh, favorable terms, uh, considering its uh, non-profit activity and the collective impact it produces. But unfortunately, the local government has shown no interest in that. So to date, there's no cooperation or support. And once again, the food cop is uh, renting a venue at market price, like any other supermarket or mini market activity. And I believe that this is actually a problem, a problem that seems to be common to both of these um, experiences that I presented, and probably many others. And I'm coming to the conclusion. Um, I believe it's really like time to, uh, for public planners, uh, entrepreneurs, local administrators, and active citizens to collectively um, rethink what actually uh, means, uh, what actually is value in our society, and more specifically, uh, what is public value and social value. So solidarity, um, it seems, can be a very powerful tool for securing sustainable future. But the conditions for it to flourish uh, must be consciously and nurtured over time. So to conclude, Avaya and Camilla both represent sustainable and potentially uh, scalable uh, ethical practices, but they obviously have you know, problems and are not free of contradictions. But here, I try to focus on the insight that we probably can draw from them. Thank you very much for your attention. Terrific. Thank you so much uh, for that. So we've come to the end of the presentation, so I will ask our presenters if they would kindly come and sit up on the chairs at the front, and we'll have a bit of a panel. I'm hoping that everyone in the room has been, you know, drafting out some questions, which we'll get to uh, later, which is great. So we'll take the opportunity of a, a joint round of applause for the presentation so far today. So oh, one of the, the words I heard quite a bit you know, was trust. You know, not everybody was talking about trust, but that seemed to be um, quite a thread that wove through um, all the presentations there. So I could see that you know, coming out in a number of ways, um, perhaps a little bit of finger pointing to inability of governments to be a bit flexible or, or seeing opportunities um, for change then. But, um, so when you think about, say, civic trust, what, what does that mean and, and what could that look like for thriving urban food futures? And I might throw that 
Um, to Stephen to start with. Oh boy, you've put me right on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Um, forgive me, could you just repeat the question? Well, you know, if we were thinking about civic trust, what does that mean and what could that look like for thriving urban food futures? Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess just to speak to the case example, mm -hmm. um, I know that in the case of the, the abattoir that had this uh, biodigester attached to it as a commercial facility, that actually took years of dialogue with the person who owned, who owned the abattoir, um, who just, until it was presented to him in commercial terms, what the benefit was going to be, which is that if you can keep your power loss costs low, you're below the tariff pricing structure, um, and then you can, you can, uh, you can um, put this thing in place and it'll work well for you, it'll work well for the person running the, the biodigester. Um, that, that's the argument that carried the day with him, but sort of the broader, co the broader conversation that we might have around um, what the kinds of contributions that could make to dealing with climate change or with other sorts of environmental issues, those sorts of, those sorts of arguments didn't carry much weight with him. So in a sense, like when we're building trusting relationships, it's about what works in that specific context. Mm -hmm. I think the, 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 the carrying that same conversation into the much bigger node that was really looking at uh, creating a link between the, the, uh, the industrial precinct, the municipal waste facility, uh, and the biodigester, um, that, that's, that's a conversation that's still ongoing. Um, and, uh, and I don't really know how it's, how it's going to turn out. I, th I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Sorry. It's going to turn out well. That's fine, Michelle. I think the other thing, too, is that when you're trying something new, and a lot of what we're talking about here is new and different, then you're basically having to do things in a way that breaks with a lot of the rules and regulations mm. that have been put in place to keep things stable. So I like rules and regulations. I'm, I'm a planner. Uh, but when you're trying to do what we've been doing, the rules and regulations often get in the way and they stop innovation. They stop new ways of happening. So the quick example is um, the EPA in New South Wales has rules about the level of um, pathogens in a material that is coming out as waste mm. and what you can then do with that in a, in a safe way. So to cut right to the point, they don't believe you can take food waste from UTS and stick it in gardens immediately um, and start growing things because there's a pathogen level in it. So they've, you know, they've ruled that out. And what was happening originally is that all of that dehydrated food waste was actually going and being incinerated. Mm to um, create energy. Not a good use of such a valuable resource, I reckon you'd agree. So uh, what we did was we had a lot of conversations and they trusted me uh, to do the right thing up, you know, when we took this waste and took it up to the farm. So um, we compost in open windrows um, because that's a low cost way to do it. I like least cost planning and, and least cost ways of doing things. We also make sure, and I didn't mention this, that there's a very, very healthy amount of coffee grounds incorporated in that dehydrated food waste. Why? Rodents and vermin don't like coffee. Humans do. Um, I love it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many of you do as well, but rodents, no, not at all. And for some reason, um, they just haven't been you know, swarming over these mounds of dehydrated food waste. And we think that's one of the reasons. The other reason why is because the food waste is dehydrated, so they can't, I don't know, they don't eat it as well. That's really important given the mice plagues that we've had recently. Um, and the other thing, um, too, is that what you've then got to make sure that you compost that material for a minimum of six months and that I have to make sure that for at least at least three consecutive days I get temperatures in my compost mounds that are above 50 degrees centigrade. And coffee makes these things heat up in ways that you wouldn't believe. And then you get these swarms of earthworms. I don't know why, but earthworms, unlike rodents, do like coffee. So there's a lot of 
Um, there's a lot of science, Snuffing if you like. Snakes. And the snakes. Oh, yeah, we won't mention them right now. Um, snakes <laughs> like the worms, so we don't get rodents, but we do get snakes. The snakes probably keep the mice down it's as living well. Soil. It is. It's a beautiful thing, only to be viewed from a tractor. Um, but, but that that the point I'm getting to is that there. You know, there is trust that is involved in monitoring all of this stuff and making sure that you are getting um, an outcome that is within the spirit, I think, of what the rules and regulations want. The rules and regulations that the EPA have are, to about, are, about, healthy, uh, are about public safety and health. They don't want soils contaminated. And so, you know, I actually have quite an important role to make sure that in this new way of doing things, um, the, the spirit of those, those rules and regulations are maintained, but we are breaking with them in order to try out and test something new and get a new model up for how to do things. Mm. So that's where I think the, the trust is, mm. you know, really quite important. It's sounding like it's emerging as a social contract in that, in, yeah. in some way, yeah. to start that discussion, getting sort of a nod and then having a go to see what it looks like. Gabriel, is that your...? Yeah, if I may add on this, um, yeah, I think um, it's obviously, like, always an open conversation. And I agree that, um, like, the legal um, framework has um, sometimes, you know, has to be stretched in a way. And, um, like, in this sense, many times, like, social innovations uh, and social innovative practices, they challenge the existing legal framework, obviously. And um, so um, we need to find a way, um, you know, to push uh, local administrators to actually be adaptive to, this, uh, to these changes. Mm. And uh, it's also like very common, like for example, in a, in a Bologna context that I was mentioning, the two um, experiences um, they both did not have like a specific and clear legal framework because even though in Italy there's uh, a long a tradition of cooperatives and cooperative movements, uh, food co-ops and community supported agriculture, they do not exist until very uh, few years ago. So it was not like a specific legal framework and they had to find ways to adapt and to think like an innovative way also like how to deal with volunteers in terms of I don't know, like insurance, for example, how to you know, uh, deal with uh, very different uh, technical and social aspects. And um, then, one last point, again, on, on trust. I also agree with Stephen very much that um, it's, it has to be like a very context-based. And uh, also, I believe that uh, like first-hand experiences, they are very helpful in that sense. So, supporting all this kind of, letting people, you know, uh, having the chance to participate, actually, to this uh, experiencing where there is an exchange. And, uh, for example, in uh, my case, again, um, creating connections between local farmers and producers to, to local residents is very, is very crucial. And, uh, you know, I can tell it for, like, uh, with myself, because I'm a member of both organizations, so... You know, I can guarantee you that it changes like the way you, uh, you reason on uh, you know, supply chains, uh, um, health issues, and so on and so forth, income for farmers, and, and so on. So that was just yeah. Terrific. And Abby, you know, for yeah. your complexity that you were bringing all these things together, what could yeah. you add? Um, so just from what Gabrielle said, I think, you know, when we look at when people started planting out verge gardens with edible plants, there was no sort of council policy. And so people sort of just got on with it and kind of nutted out and worked out um, what they could and couldn't do um, in time. And so the kind of council policies emerged from that um, process. So I think it's really important to sort of act and then apologise later. Um, in some, particularly with social innovations, we're human, we make mistakes, sorry, didn't know. Um, you know, there's lots of ways that we can just get on with doing things. And I think civic trust is a really important extension of trust to people. We're not necessarily just self-interested consumers or, you know, um, we, we actually uh, appreciate and respond to um, collective ownership and goodwill. 
and um, the ability to be invited into, say, a pilot study or a university study, um, people rise to the challenge, they participate. Um, so I think there is an extension of trust um, that needs to be given to um, everyday citizens to try things new. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Community are often the source of the innovation and the mm. ideas. Yeah, exactly. And the power behind change. Absolutely. I thought I might um, take a, a little bit of a, a, a directional shift and just look at some of the questions we've received from our online um, audience. So Nathan English asked a question, is the six cities mega region around Sydney food secure now and into the future? And what needs to change? It's a big question. <laughs> I'll have a go at that. Um, water is always a big issue. So uh, that's one of the, the key resources that we need. Um, in terms of, I guess, the quality of soils, uh, at the moment, most areas, as I understand it, are still very much dependent on synthetic fertilisers. Um, uh, so are we secure long into the future? Uh, I, I think, you know, that's very unclear and uncertain at the moment. I think if we were, um, if we had the sort of relationship that I was talking about and it was much stronger between the food wastes and different waste types that are coming from our, our city, if, you know, farmers need to start looking at cities as a resource mm. and so that um, it's not just about urban areas looking at whether their food sources are secure in and around them, but there needs to be this reci mm. reciprocity yeah. between the two. Uh, we're not there yet, you know, which is, we all know that we're not and there yet, you, but yeah. we could be. We I'm glad be. you circled around to that because, again, that's extension of, you know, whatever that social contract is or if I put my planner hat on, I think strategically if we've got, you know, this integrated region, it's not just the, the six centres, it's everything in the interface and how we might, you know, what, what do you think we need to do policy-wise? Is there something that should happen in the planning policy or other policies to enable this to occur? Um, there's, oh, it's hard. There, there's a lot of things that need to go in, on in the regulatory framework to help support the sort of system that, um, that we have been trying to develop. So I'll give you one very small example of that. So one of the biggest problems that I have is with those little stickers that go on fruit <laughs> and vegetable. I know everyone does that. Oh, I groan as well. I just... Ah. OK, so I'm digging up through those mounds that you saw. I'm seeing the worms. They're, it's great. And then, oh, here goes a sticker. Oh, another bit of plastic. So getting stickers and plastic out of your waste so that I can safely put it back into the soils um, that I'm growing food that you are then going to eat, mm. it, you know, there needs to be some more regulation around that and there needs to be more thought. And it's not just a case... I'm going to be very polemical now and say, um, you know, where governments go, oh, yeah, the packaging industry have got it sorted. No, 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 they haven't. Mm. Packaging needs to be seen as something that now has a very deep relationship with soil health. And, grow, and the growing of food. And this is a very big part of the circular economy in that suddenly different suppliers have relationships with other types of people and users that they didn't know they had before. And so this is where, you know, just the regulations need to be looked at. Um, and you can go through the whole list of, you know, policy. Um, there's also a big logistics piece in transport, you know, the sorts of transport infrastructure that needs to be put in place to facilitate these sorts of relationships is also quite... Um, it's very doable, but it's a very different way of thinking about the problem. So there's quite a few areas that, you know, need to be ticked off there that we need to yeah. rethink. Mm -hmm. Stephen. Yeah, look, a few things come to mind for me. Um, <clears throat> um, one of it has to do with, with the role that natural gas plays in fertilizer production, right? So when you make nitrogen fertilizer, it's natural gas mixed with atmospheric nitrogen under high pressure, and that's where you get ammonium nitrate, right? So you can't do large-scale farming without NPK, without some kind of fertilizer. And when you go to a place like Cowra, or lots of regional centres throughout Australia, 
um, what you're seeing are farms that are really dependent upon fertilizer that's produced in an international market. The price of fertilizer, like the price of natural gas, has gone through the roof. And I think as we move into this new era where there's going to be a lot more conflict over resources, uh, where Russia is projecting political power, but I, I can imagine easily that other nations might start to do that as well. I think that really forces the issue of what a, what a circular system is meant to conserve. So the other way of thinking about the role of biodigestion is that there's a, there's, there you, can, you can use wet biodigestion to produce natural gas, which you can then turn into electrical power or a variety of other things. Uh, but there's another type of biodigestion called pyrolysis, uh, which produces biochar, which can be an alternative fertilizer source. So I guess for me, the cower example is a, a, a context for thinking bigger about mm -hmm. what kind of food system depends on what kind of relationship with waste. Yeah. Uh, and that those two things need to be considered simultaneously. Yeah. So I'm finding my voice after a time, and, which means I now I'm in a position to respond to your question earlier about trust. Um, one thing that's interesting about Gabby's examples is that, that, that both the CSA and the food co-op kind of blur the line between who's a worker and who's a consumer. Right, and so that's and that's strange in the Italian context, where like the boundaries around co-ops are are very tight. The way that unions define who's a worker in a particular way. So that's I think where trust becomes an issue is having to renegotiate roles. Um, I think it's the same proposition in Caura. The idea of an entity operating for the benefit of a town or a region seems unusual, but it's actually not unprecedented. So I think about the scholar Greg Patmore, who just retired from Sydney Uni. He gave a beautiful long history of co-ops in the Australian context. That's how people have gotten together and formed collectivities to solve problems in this society since its foundation. So it's, you know, it's not that a, the clean example is not, um, it, it has a history that it could draw on, I think, if we thought yeah. in broader terms about what does it mean to cooperate. It's not new. We know no. how to do it. So um, I'm conscious of the time. I thought we'd uh, draw questions from the audience. Well, maybe we could have one or two. Hi, um, thank you for those um, amazing presentations. It's really great to hear what's uh, going on, uh, you know, in, in universities. And um, I've got a question from the point of view of local councils. So circular economy is uh, quite helpfully becoming more of a buzzword um, across the political spectrum. And, um, uh, and, and I was just wondering, so there are councils and councillors that are interested in, well, you know, what can we do for the circular economy? Is there somewhere, and I know that the, the state government is looking at it as well, but does it, does um, a, uh, is there somewhere where people can go to find information about the different projects that are happening on the ground? And if not, would that be a good idea so that, uh, for instance, I was asked, oh, you know, um, do you know what's it, well, you know, what can we do in our council area for the circular economy? Now, that's a really sort of broad question, but, um, you know, there seems to be much more of a willingness to do something. It's just that uh, uh, people uh, maybe just don't know where to start. So, um, yeah. yeah, any ideas about that? Yeah, um, I can just respond. I mean, I've done projects, circular economy projects, not so much in food futures with councils. And one of the critical things is, you know, for council to recognise what's already going on in the community that are steps towards circularity and actually allow that to sort of flourish. I mean, uh, back to The Verge, <laughs> you know, The Verge is a site for either illegal dumping or uh, an informal circulation of materials, an exchange site. And look, it's not that black and white, but there are ways in which council can develop tolerances to enable circularity to flourish, given what we've said about social innovation. I think that's one thing. And also, council websites tend to be quite punitive, full of rules about the things you can't do. Um, I think there's a way of uh, in, you know, engaging communities um, with that sense of civic trust that's a little bit more open, a little Perhaps it's a bit more resource intense, but I do recognise that there's a lot being um, placed upon councils to facilitate and negotiate at that local level, and something's got to give there as well. But um, I just thought I'd share those observations. We have another question at the back here, and then we. Thanks, and almost another local government question from a current councillor or former councillor. Um, I'm thinking about the 
issue of full cost accounting because in the example you gave Michelle about burning waste which has been nicely dried is actually quite horrifying to most of us, I think. Mm. But I'm interested here in the role of government. On the one hand, we've got local government which is actually trying to engage in this. We've also got the privatisation of things like waste services in New South Wales, which it seems to me might put in a different perspective rather than that sort of community focus that I guess is open to anyone. How do we get that community environmental focus in a, in a situation where we've got that, what seems to me a, a, the opposite, which is, which is simply short-term money-making or money-saving from government, either directly or indirectly, through privatisation of, of natural government services? Um, yeah, off the top of my head, I think a lot of it, those sorts of problems all change once you seriously have to confront the problem of reducing emissions. And now there is legislation at the federal level. I, I look at the reduction in emissions that has been legislated, it's really big. You know, people say we should do more. Look, if we can just get to where the, where the legislation is at the moment will be great. Um, when, yeah, it's, I think it is very difficult because when obviously a private enterprise has got a motive which is to run a profit um, and sometimes the structure of the relationships or the boundary around which that entity the, and the privatisation has taken place it might be that the, the, the cost relationships within that boundary and within that entity don't necessarily get you to that end point of reducing emissions as, as in an optimum way. So if I then put you know, the engineering perspective on things, um, sometimes optimisation occurs through quite a number of different partners. And so this is when you know, the terms of collaboration and partnership then come out. But how do you do that with, so, with an entity that wants to make money? That's very hard. Um, but, you know, councils also have choices and so do state governments and they can set targets and aims on what to do specifically with food waste. And then I think those sorts of frameworks then begin to force the hand of different entities within... But it, the question is, you know, how do you pick the right target? How do you pick the right boundaries? How do you pick the right frameworks and what have you um, in order to achieve the sorts of outcomes that are going to genuinely reduce emissions on the ground? That, that's really tough. So this is where case studies help. Um, but the sort of thing that, that we, in our case we've tried to do is to get a, a case study going that you could then upscale, hopefully, uh, and then, but as you do that, then I think the sorts of relationships that you have to develop with local council and, and hopefully the sorts of things that you need to do or would like to do then begin to become a little bit clearer. But it's hard when your time... You, we don't have the time that we used to have to experiment with these things. That's really hard. And talking about time, I think we have about 90 yeah. seconds. Left, so we might, um, <laughs> ask, have one more question. <coughs> Um, thank you. I don't think that's on, but I've got a loud voice. No, it is? Sorry. Okay. Um, so you were saying your um, coffee um, relationship or, or recycling the coffee and using it for fertiliser was fair, a fairly new um, project. Mm. Um, how widespread is it? And if it isn't, how do you see that becoming... Sorry, I've got it in a little bit. How do you see it becoming so? And, for example, you know, there's coffee shops all around Sydney. How do you upscale that? And just a comment, sorry, back to the local councils. I find it quite interesting that local councils that are neighbouring each other do waste so differently when it's yeah. such a universal thing. So one council mm -hmm. can be doing FOGO, mm -hmm. another yeah. not. And they've all got... They seem to be quadrupling yeah. up on yeah. the way they do things and all doing it quite differently. Mm. So, sorry, that, that's two questions and I know we don't no. have time, but... <laughs> yeah, sorry. The, the diversity on that question. front is something I find fascinating as well. Yeah. Look, FOGO, I think, is really important and at a state government level, you could set... There could be a universal target or consistency, that might be a better word, um, developed in that area. Um, in relation to coffee... 
Uh, and there's a hell of a lot of very beautiful, positive social relationships that can be built around coffee and food and all this sort of thing. Um, the things that I have relayed to you are things that I have noticed over 10 years of composting, some of it done in a building and some of it done out on a farm. Um, and I, I'm a transport planner, so I haven't written that up. I haven't written academic papers on it. I haven't gone and spoken at events like this until now about coffee grounds and what that is a particular waste um, product can do. There is a project that was carried out at the City of Sydney about coffee grounds and collecting it, but once again, that was looking at a very small um, part of that circular supply chain. And they had as, their, as one of their first goals, which was how do you make it economically or fiscally viable? And what I've learned with experimentation and innovation is that you, you cannot have that as your first aim. You're never going to make it pay when you do it the first time around because you're learning what's going on and it takes a while to work out how skinning that system your works. <laughs> you're skinning your knees. Yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of skin. Um, but, yeah, I think the one of the things that we're wanting to do now, um, and I'm working hopefully with uh, Abby and Stephen over the next couple of months, is to look at how we upscale that circular chain that we've been talking about and trying to find councils that are willing to help with that oh, um, would be a big part of it. So a lot of the, to finish off very quickly, because we're time stretched, a lot of the coffee, um, some of you may have even had coffee at Campos at Newtown. Um, that's where I was getting about half a tonne of coffee a week, coffee grounds a week from them. Um, I did a few calculations on how much coffee I could get from King Street and Enmore Road, and I think it was, it was about three, three or four tonnes a week. I'd love that. You have no idea. That would just make... I, I would be so happy as a farmer if I had that much coffee grounds, you know. But Sydney as a whole, just... Oh, think of the, the amounts there. We could do all of Lithgow with that. So <laughs> Marvellous. So I, I think the lesson there is that we have to keep our coffee habit up. Yeah. So we can exactly. in, invest in our, our farmers in the interface. Mm. So um, on, that, on that note, um, I just, uh, I just like to, to thank everybody for the questions and and uh, say we've got some more questions, but we might reserve those until after the end of the official event. But uh, thank you all for joining. This is actually the, the last event for the 2022 Festival of Urbanism, and I'd like to congratulate everyone involved in the org organising of this terrific festival and for everyone who has participated. Uh, the recording will be up on the website for all these um, uh, events and for those of you in the room, please come and join us for refreshments. And as a last note, would you all join me please in thanking our speakers today. Thank you.